Could be any one of them, but which one? Wh which ones? <gasps> Pretty fishy what happened to me on that ladder. You mean where there's a fish, there could be a penguin? But wait, it happened at sea. See? See for Catwoman. Yet that exploding shark was pulling my leg. The Joker. It all adds up to a sinister riddle. Riddle-er. Riddler? Oh, thought strikes me. So dreadful, I scarcely dare give it utterance. Hello, listening people. Hello. Oh, hello, old chum. Hi, young chum. <laughs> I'm Ryan. <laughs> and I'm Bartek. And we are spit and polished likingly because we are always spitting and we are deputized agents of the law, as well as Polish, which... I could have just said Polish, you would have known that we're deputized agents of the law and that we take that very seriously. Mm -hmm. As of this recording, still top 10 Polish podcasts. Still top 10. Number four. Number four, one day, number one. Yeah, we're going to beat, I think it was like a learning Polish podcast. We're going to beat them. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. To beat them, we've got to become them. So how about instead of going straight into our Pictures Power Wow show, the, movie, the show in which we review a movie that's come recommended, how about you... Learn us some Polish. So I'm going to pretend that I don't know any Polish, just <laughs> for the listening people's sake. I'm going to be them, and I'm going to ask you to learn me some Polish. <laughs> so, so Bartek, what is a beloved Polish song? Um, You know what? I remember, like... A dozen years ago, World Youth Day was happening in Melbourne. Yes. And my grandmother had, I think it was like four guests, like uh, pilgrims from Poland coming over to yeah. do the celebration. And they were very, very lovely people. I remember one of them... Were they fighters? I think they. I think when they're at home, they're fighters, but they were very <laughs> polite. One of them was a priest. <laughs> and last week, I wanted to mention this last week, actually, no joke. When you were talking about how um, Kola Loka was like being used as a you know blessing to yes. revive clinical death he actually blessed my uncle's pool like swimming pool was it a holy pool it is now okay there we go i learned <laughs> to be something but what's a song you were going to say a song yes um they were singing this one song which was um what was it uh Gdzie jest ta ulica, gdzie jest ten dom, gdzie jest ta dziewczyna, co kocham Dziewczyna, I remember that. I remember yeah, that, that means girl. Uh, znalazłem ulicę, znalazłem dom, znalazłem yeah. dziewczynę, co kocham ją. I love how you say dziewczyna, because it sounds like too, it does sound like a name, like, oh, dziewczyna. Yeah, it's, it's not like Jeff China, but it's a different form, yeah. So what's that song? I don't know what it's called, but I just remember those lyrics. It's basically like... He's singing, where is that street, where is that house, where is that girl I love? And then the second line is, I found, instead of where is. Well, there you go. I really wanted you to throw me a curveball that at the end of that saying, is, well, Ryan, that, that beloved song is, of course, by U2. <laughs> and then just reveal it's, that U2 is the most popular band in Poland. It's a translation of an Eminem song, actually. <laughs> Called Venom. <laughs> and we get, a, we get a copyright strike on this episode from, from, Not the people, again. from the people who have ownership of Venom. They're like, he did it, but in Poland. Polish, that motherfucker's not going to get past Eminem. Polish Eminem. Well, I mean, I think uh, there are youths in Poland who like to be like uh, white gangsters, I guess. We've talked about this before, yeah. but I like how you call them youths. <laughs> Maybe there's, they're not that young. There's, there's youths there. So... Euthanasia. Who is there? That has nothing to do with anything. I just is there euthanasia it. in Poland? I don't think so. I mean, they, they. I mean, they don't have rights for fucking women, let alone <laughs> I was people want to say, fucking die. I was about to say, do you hear their abortion stuff recently? Oh uh, yeah, you're right. So to get on a lighter topic, we mentioned Eminem, and that makes me think of <laughs> of Venom, which makes me think of heroes. We are going to be talking today about Batman. The movie from 1966, starring Adam West and Burt Ward and Burgess Meredith and Cesar Romero and Lee Merriweather and and Frank Gorshin and uh, and others. I think I listed all the main players. Yeah, there. I think you did. I I, I didn't get uh, the chief, <laughs> but that's okay. And the commissioner, but we'll get there. Uh, so if you have not seen Batman 66 uh, with Adam West. Give it a watch. Uh, it's a fun time. Uh, it is light, breezy, and easy. You're not going to get triggered by anything unless you're really afraid of being dehydrated. And uh, come back because we're going to be spoiling Batman 66. Yeah, if, if you like The Dark Knight, you'll definitely like this. 
if you're a big fan of The Dark Knight Rises, you'll be a big fan of this because The Dark Knight Rises was really inspired by this. Yeah, wasn't there like trivia about bombs in both films? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. And no, not no, oh, not the orphans. <laughs> this film needed that. They needed when Batman's running with a bomb, he needed to run into a bunch of orphans and go, no, and then run away. Because that's what happened in The Dark Knight Rises with the bomb and, and, and uh, uh, kid from Third Rock from the Sun, whose name Joseph Gordon Levitt. He was like with the bus full of orphans. Yeah, I, I remember. And he's like, I no, was... not the bomb. And he's like driving his bus away from the bomb. And it was like a joke. I was reading the trivia. I'm like, was there a bomb in that? I don't remember. Now that you're telling me, Bane's whole now. thing was, I've got a bomb in a truck. You're never going to get it. I thought there were like multiple bombs around the city. No, it was a big else. one. No, the, they were decoy trucks that That's made you right. think there were bombs. Yes. This is not a review of the Dark Knight Rises. This is a review of Batman sixty six. So. So, Bartek, what is your history and relationship with this movie and with this series, with the series which this movie yep. spawned from, a.k.a. what is your history with Adam West's Batman? Uh, for this movie, I'd never seen it. The only things I had seen of it were on YouTube. It was, I think, the two big mimetic scenes, which were the, mm-hmm. the bomb scene, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb, yep. and the shark scene, which yeah. happens very early in the film. It's one of the first gags in the movie. Yeah. One of the first big ones. Not the iconic, well, it's only, it's not too far away. We can do a brisk run there and you have them <laughs> running with the backdrop. <laughs> um, That's another mimetic scene. Yeah, so I hadn't seen the film, only seen those two scenes from it. In fact, I think it was only like within the last 10 years that I actually mm. knew a film of it existed. I just assumed that was from like the TV show at some yes. point. Yes. Um, but I was pleasantly surprised to find out it does exist, and when we picked it, when it was picked for this show, I was happy. Um, it's a listening people's choice, by the way. Uh, and <laughs> yes, as, it is. Yes. And as for the TV series, I remember when I was a kid, I would watch some episodes when they aired on TV with my dad. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So do you have a strong recollection or any kind of vague recollection of what it, what those were like? I, Any ones that you remember or it, a villain you remember? Because that's kind of what the, yeah. sh- the show is. is like in, The movie's like, hey, we've got all the best ones here. Yeah, it, it was in- it's incredibly vague, my memories. I remember there was an episode that ended with Batman getting stuck in a birthday cake. Yes. And then in the next episode, he just gets out of it very quickly. <laughs> that's every episode. He's stuck <laughs> in something, he gets out real quick. Yeah. Um, that's the main thing I remember, but I do remember enjoying the show. It was very, you know... Easy entertainment, very funny, and I would look forward to watching it. I don't know if I've ever... uh, I know that with the birthday one, I definitely watched both parts. Mm. I can't remember if I watched, like, every single two-parter that I started. That's the first two seasons of Batman 66. They're all two-parters, except for when there are three-parters. And then the third seasons are all, like, singular episodes, except for when there are some double or triples. How, How do you know that? Do you have a history with this show? I am a big fan of the 60s Adam West Batman show and the movie. I cannot remember when I first saw them, but I was a big fan when I was a child of the Val Kilmer um, Batman Forever movie. I loved that movie. And that, obviously, people know Joel Schumacher's Batman movies harken back more to this show and this movie with its kind of more campy, over-the-top tone. Jim Carrey is just doing Frank Gorshin, and we'll talk about that because, uh, Bartek, with what you just said, it kind of get the impression that you're not as familiar straight off the bat with these actors' takes oh, yeah. on the characters. But I, I, I think it's safe to say that you definitely looked at Frank Gorshin's uh, Riddler and said, oh, that's what Jim Carrey did. Because that's just what Jim... Jim Carrey just did this performance. Again. My, Again. my memories of Batman Forever are also very vague, but I can believe that. It's a kiss of a, from a rose. That's how vague it is. That was the big song. Seal's uh, Kiss from a Rose is the big theme song in Batman Forever. is like a pop song by Seal about kissing. Okay. Oh, well, that's that. But I loved those. I loved that movie. And that is where I really got to know the 60s Batman stuff. And I can't remember the exact time I saw these, but they've just always kind of been around, but also kind of not around, because if you're a fan of the Adam West era, uh, you know that for the longest of times, 
it was actually quite hard to see these. Uh, they would run, rerun on certain TV programs if you're in America, perhaps, but if you're overseas, less likely. And physical distribution of them really did not happen until recent years because there was all these copyright issues with music and who owned this and who owned that, which all got resolved, and you could buy them all on Blu-ray. Yeah, this is the only non-Warner Brothers Batman thing, right? I'm pretty sure. Uh, and yeah. so... I grew up with them in some way, shape, or form. In the movie, I probably saw the most out of the Adam West catalog until recent years when I bought the series on Blu-ray and I've been watching them and I finished watching them and, yeah, I love them and uh, I've always had an appreciation for his character. And like you, Bartek, we both grew up in this era in which Adam West got this resurgence in animated shows in particular, but in other things where the joke was he was Batman once. My like my one is the 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 Simpsons. I always think of him and and Burt Ward in the Simpsons and just him as himself when it's like Homer being walking where it's like don't make eye contact, yeah. children. He's like e ah ooh ah. How come Batman doesn't dance anymore? Yeah, and his iconic line of I didn't eat no plastic mold, pure West. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like and you see the movie and you're like, yep, pure West. Yeah. Except when it's a stunt double, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, even though like even though I watched it as a kid, I. At that point, I wasn't really taking into account, like, oh, who is this actor? I didn't remember him, Adam West. But because he appeared in so many animated shows that I watched, like, that name just kept recurring. Like, oh, that guy from Johnny Bravo is now in The Simpsons, Family Guy, Fairly Odd Parents. Like, Mm. this must be a real guy. And then I found out, like, oh, he was Batman in that show I used to watch. He is Batman. Uh, And so I love this movie. And we got this suggested by one of the listening people, uh, a friend of... uh, one of our previous guests, Sam Noonan, his friend, uh, David, if I do believe, if I'm right, he recommended after our discussion of The Dark Knight Rises, because we did talk about Adam West briefly in that, because there was a little reference to Burt Ward in there, and I, was it Adam West as well? But I remember there's a reference to Burt Ward with the football player's name saying Ward on the back, and I was like, oh, it would have been oh, neat right. if Adam West was actually allowed to be in these movies in some way, shape, or form, and then we got into a debate about no it wouldn't because people wouldn't take it seriously because he's adam west and i was like oh that's kind of a tragedy because that, adam that west was... was actually a really talented actor and you know for a series where the dark knight rises is, is oh so serious and yet it it, it 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 is a movie where it has oh no not the orphans <laughs> that was the very first listener's choice right yeah yeah, yeah. and so We've been sitting, holding off and talking about it, but it just felt like, now this is the time. We've had a few interesting ones, and what do you follow up Lemonade Joe with? You followed up with another cartoony camp movie from around the same time, two years later. And I had a feeling that you you hadn't seen this movie. I couldn't recollect if you had, but I know for one thing I really wanted to talk about, and I just want to dive into it, is... You have not seen or do not recollect having seen Burgess Meredith as the Penguin. You know him just from the Rocky movies. I know him from Rocky and that... uh... Rocky 2, Rocky (laughs) 3, (laughs) archive footage in Rocky (laughs) 4, memories and there's a ghost in Rocky (laughs) 5. No, I know him from all of those and the, um, that... That computer game that Christopher Lloyd, uh, not Christopher Lloyd, Christopher Walken's like a detective in Burgess Meredith's also in that. Okay, okay. So I really want to just dive in. What I mean, we've got to talk about Adam West, but, what, but, but I was really keen because you're a big Rocky fan. You're a bigger I, Rocky fan than I am. You've watched them you all s- and you've referred to them on the pod a lot. Just because I think it's a common thing people have seen. It's not that, that I'm a huge fan of them, but yeah. You're, you're heartbroken when you couldn't see the new Creed movie with a bunch of friends. That's so. because they... They, they lied to me. They ignored me. They, I'm fed up with this world. They, they said, hey, who wants to see it with us? And I said, me. And then they're like, hey, that movie was all right. And I'm like, you didn't take me. But you're, you, you're, you're a fan of the Rocky movies. And he is an important player in those movies. He is in all five of the original movies, even in archival footage. But he was in, he was in them. Yeah, he was in the first three for sure. Um, he was important to those. He, you wouldn't have the later Rocky movies without that character because he's Rocky's whole character is he's just become his character now, <laughs> pretty much, right? He's the old coach. He, he owns his gym. He's, yeah, he's yeah. basically not as much of a grouch, but pretty well, much, no, yeah. because he's Rocky. 
But you know what I'm saying. So I was really keen on hearing your thoughts on what is probably his most I- other iconic role, the Penguin. Mm. So iconic, that so well done, that apparently the script writers for the TV show always had several different Penguin scripts just on the ready for e- for whenever he wanted to come guest star on the show because they loved him that much as the Penguin. <laughs> that They never tried to have anyone else and they just had like 10 different Penguin scripts just ready to go if he was, if he was available. So what did you think of the Burgess Meredith Penguin? Yeah, he was very fun. He, like, the Penguin I'm mostly familiar with is um, animated series and the later Arkham games. So Not Danny DeVito? Was that the second Tim Burton yeah. film? No, I haven't seen that one. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, he was he was a lot of fun. Like, I remember a couple of years ago I saw footage from it and he was actually doing, like, the Penguin, like, meh, meh, meh. Yes. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> that that caught me off guard because that's not what I'm used to. It was a lot of fun, and even in this film, you could kind of tell that like of the antagonist, he's the main antagonist. His little walk and his hat <laughs> kind of bobs with it, and he's got the cigarette holder, and he's always got like that shitty, shitty grin. <laughs> <laughs> and he's because he's got a. I love what I love about the Burgess Meredith Penguin, and you see it in the movie. It's a performance made by pure brilliance, but also necessity, mm-hmm. because. He's he he gave up smoking like he he was a smoker and then he didn't want to smoke anymore he gave up smoking but then he did it again because he had you know the penguin has a cigarette holder and the laugh came from necessity because he would choke and cough and he didn't want to ruin takes so he incorporated that into the laugh and then the shooting and grin is because he's trying to keep his fucking monocle in so he's having to (laughs) and it's just like the nose and. It's a performance that comes from brilliant choices from the director and actor, but also just the necessity of the beast. And sometimes that can be the defining moment of a character is we, the audience, don't notice that. But if you really look into it, you're like, of course, of course, that's the As reason why this thing, this thing and this thing are happening. But I play, it actually yeah. adds to the charm. In year 12, I played a character that always had a monocle on one of his mm. eyes. And I remember like your face, you have to really keep it. In. Yes. Yeah. You have to keep it scrunched up. And I, but I love the Penguin. He's great in this. Burgess Meredith was really great. See, for me, I have a hard time recollecting what he's like in the Rocky movies because I always think of him as the Penguin. The Penguin's like charming, ruthless, very cartoony, very physical. He, yeah, he doesn't he, really look like Mickey at all. <laughs> but he does when you look at him as well. You're like, of course and that's you're like, him. Oh, well, that's Burgess Meredith. Let me look closer. Oh, yeah. Underneath the big... Makeup nose and the top hat and the feathery <laughs> little vest he's got on. Uh, just this every... was only like a little over a dozen years before the first Rocky, right? Yeah, this this yeah. sixty six. So yeah, it's uh, pretty crazy. But I just want to dive into that. So you did not know what this movie was about? No, not really. I knew there was a shark and that there was a bomb. So. Give the the listening people just a quick rundown of the plot, just so that we can recollect, and what your impressions of this was. So the plot of this film is that uh, a... I can't remember the character's name, but it's a guy that owns a yacht. Yes, Schnibblab. Commodore Schmidlab. Some sort of schmidlab name. Penguin says it like 50 times. It does, yes, but it's been 24 hours. Schmidlab. Almost. Uh, yeah, this guy has been, uh, abducted Mm -hmm. by a mysterious villain or group of villains that Batman has to deduce. (laughs) The United Underworld. United (laughs) Underworld. And, uh, it's basically a long plot to rescue him, but uh, on the way, the villains or the villain or villains unleash a bunch of extra plots that, uh, stop Batman in his tracks. He has to keep dealing with them. Uh, and it leads to just a lot of hijinks. Like as someone who I did watch the TV show when I was a kid, um, but I don't remember it that well. I get the feeling that this film is very much a feature length episode kind of thing. Yeah. They even have moments in which the characters of Batman and Robin are like, we're not going to get out of this one. And then they have a little pause and then they're like, but we did. <laughs> yeah. Even- that's like the, where the, where the end credits would start and the narrator who is in this movie would go, how will they get out of this one? The caped crusader and the boy wonder in trouble. Yeah. Come back next week. Same, same bat time, time same, same bat, bat channel. channel. 
Um, yeah. Uh, j- skipping over the opening credits, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the film itself opens with an overhead view of this yacht, and the narrator just like this yacht, and just like goes right into what the story. That's the show. That's the exact. You know, that's not a voice actor. That's just the producer. I'm pretty sure. sure. Oh, yeah, sure. And they just said, hey, you want to do it? And he was like, sure, I'll do it. Like when they did the pilot or something, they were like, we need someone. He was like, oh, I'll fucking do it. And he's just like, all right, so this is Batman here. And then they just kept him because he's a character in his own right. And you can tell in the movie because every now and then he'll just pop in there to remind you, I'm here too, guys. <laughs> But yeah, the film just opens with the narration that begins with this yacht, and it's just like right into the story. Mm. Batman needs to do this. You see Batman doing this. And yeah, yeah. Going on. It actually takes like you know ten minutes before we get like proper like dialogue to explain like yeah. what's happened because the first twist I guess happens. The yacht disappears. Yes, it was a mirage. And but the basic plot is: super villains have captured a piece of surprising technology, mm-hmm. and they're going to use it for a ransom. They're gonna kidnap by dehydrating world leaders and keeping them in little individual vials. Got to be careful with how you scoop them in there. They all have mothers. Yes. And <laughs> that was a great line. An improvised line too. Yeah. And they want like billions of dollars for this. And I love... A like, billion from each country. A billion from yeah. each. So nine billion dollars. And I love it because it reminds me so much of... You know in Austin Powers there's that gag where he's traveled and he's like i want this much money and they he all always, laugh at he it because it's so a ludicrous amount depending on the period he's in yeah. yeah yeah it's like a ludicrously small amount by modern standards but then when he goes back in time he asks for a higher amount they laugh at him because it's like the whole world doesn't have that much money well, you don't want a bajillion jillion dollars <laughs> <laughs> and i love that it makes me think of that in this period where it's like if i was going for like a billion dollars for each country that would like yeah, completely this is, ruin each country because this is the decade that dr evil's from <laughs> yeah 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 and uh I, uh, yeah, so the plot is just, they have a super weapon, and it's all the villains have joined together, and like you said, they're just throwing wrenches in Batman's way that he'll trip over so that he can't stop them immediately, because Batman is perfect. Batman and Robin are completely perfect geniuses that are Mary Sue's up to the 10th degree to the point of being funny. Yes, and, it, they use it for comedy greatly. And, <laughs> and if Batman just walked in he would stop everything from the movie so they have to contrive in very fun ways but it's still contrive each individual villain tag teams him in some way to throw the things so catwoman you sexually distract him over there and riddler you shoot a missile at him over here and penguin you pretend to be schnidlab or whatever and and joker you're here too yes <laughs> like he doesn't get as much to do but i, I was gonna say that yeah He's here, though. He's pretty fun. Mm. Joker, you get to laugh manically on the uh, flying umbrella thing that we got. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's the plot. It's very simple. It's very boy play, but the th- basic thing is, the most important thing is, the villains team up to go against the hero. There's and a- that's always exciting, no matter no matter what. You know, That's what people wanted from the Justice League movie, or see all the heroes team up, finally, to fight a villain. But it's always fun when we see all the villains team up to go, you know what, if we can settle our own differences and just unite under the banner of we want to kill Batman or whatever, then we could do it. But then it's always fun in these things of it always falls apart because all villains in these comic books have supreme egos that do not work with one another. There's that fun line one of them, um, one of the police characters has. (laughs) It was an exchange, actually, where they're like, uh, oh, there's two of them, they could easily take over the city. Three of them, the whole country, no problem. But four of them... The whole world. Yeah, yeah, it was like the commissioner who was like this, and then Batman was always denying. It's like, no, no, no. If it was two of them, maybe this. And then and then three of them, maybe the country. I could see that. But four? Gotta be the whole world. Like, <laughs> that reminds me of like the gag that we had in the early mystery boxes where I'm like, if we just had one more person, we'd be fine. <laughs> so... What did you think of the movie? This movie has a legacy, a memetic one. It's often pointed to as like, oh, well, see, this is the reason the Joel Schumacher movies fucking suck because 60s Batman and exists. Mm. And even if you don't know the plot, you kind of know things about the movie. Oh, it has the shark repellent. And oh, Adam West is going to say old chum. And they have the running and they have the tights. And you have Cesar Romero has a mustache underneath his makeup. And Burgess Meredith is great as the penguin. We all know this. It's all a fact. But... What what did you think of it when you sat down and you, you finally got to inject the 60s camp straight into your veins as a full-grown adult? The the laughter started and was prevalent very early on. I was having a really good time with it. 
Well, what was what was what was one of the funny moments early on for you that just hit you? Other than the narrator, obviously, <laughs> because he's funny. Oh, uh, dude! Like w- without trying, he's very funny. I think so many things happened before even Batman had a line. Like he was flying in the the Batcopter, and like <laughs> police see him and like salute, take off their hats. Yeah. There's a guy and a girl under a tree who just see him. It's like, oh, I'm so glad he's doing the thing he does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that he has full authority to do yeah. fuck, crime, fight, crime fighting, yeah. Yeah, just so, so much, like, wholesome whimsy, I guess, towards Batman. Yes. Which, again, compared to Dark Knight Rises and all that, is just so... Yeah, night and day. Night and day. Well, day. You, there's a lot of daytime in this. Yeah, and colours. Not so much dark. Dutch angles. <laughs> Dutch angles. Very very fun Dutch angles, yeah. They're always there when villains are there. Yeah, I, I was watching the film, I'm like, oh, I see, it's because they're not on the straight and narrow. Then I go online, it's like, oh, it's because it's crooked. I'm like, ah, oh, two, two meanings. <laughs> One of my favourite visual jo- jokes that I didn't notice in previous watches, but I did notice this time, and it's a very obvious one, but I really like, we're in the villain's lair, and you have the Joker, the Riddler, and the Penguin, and they're all arguing with one another about something. And the Riddler is, you know, I'm fed up with this. And he walks away and you see the camera follows him over and he rests on a bookcase. Mm-hmm. And then the the Penguin does the same and then the Joker does the same. And on each bookcase it has, like, riddles. And there's, like, a book of riddles and he walks over that. Yeah, and then the Penguin own... has, like, fish, uh, penguin food. It's they got, have like, their own, fish. like, little pigeonholes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then the Joker's, like, jokes and whatever. He leads over there. And I, I've never, like, I know it's been there, but I've just, this one, it really took me. And I was like, because with the Adam West Batman stuff... A lot of it is just gags, right? Yeah. And it's always easy to focus on the audio gags, like the the dialogue and the stilted performances that are on purpose, like Adam West being like, "What? what is this riddle? And Burt Ward slamming his fist into his head and ringing it, going, of course, a bird with a machine gun. And it's like a sparrow with a machine gun. And like all of that's very funny. Or like, ah, that porpoise really sacrificed its life by throwing... All that's very fun, but I always do appreciate with the Adam West Batman era, they also had a great visual style that that people always attribute, oh, it's colourful. But they, they have great visual gags like that where you just see that and you're like, oh, now that's from a comic book. You can just see that in the yeah. comic book there's being a, There's a lot of gags in this film where it's like everything's labelled. Well, that's just, that's the show, that's Batman in general. <laughs> and I think they did that because in the comics they would have to label the things so that yeah. the readers knew what they were. So they took that I spe- verbatim the- and just did it because... <laughs> the first one that really got me was the Bat Ladder, which just had Bat Ladder written at the bottom <laughs> that we got a shot for. I thought one of your favourite early on gags would be when, he, when Batman asked asks for the shark repellent and he goes of course I'll get you the shark repellent and then you see a static shot of all the different repellents yeah, and, the, the, and, the Robert's, repellents, and yeah. Robert's hair just hovering over which one he's gonna pick yeah. just that is just it's that silly basic yeah, level t- comedy that it's effective all these decades later still yeah I remember I remember that from the YouTube video but it was still very funny it's just hmm, hmm which one is it oh then here it is <laughs> they, yeah they they <laughs> It's funny, like, whenever you hear about, like, you know, stereotypes or, or like, impressions, like, oh, everyone yeah. knows the Arnold impression, you just go... Bleh, 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 bleh. But then when you actually listen to him talk, like, he actually talks, like, kind of clearly, but he has got the accent. Yeah. Um, if I heard, like, Jimmy Stewart ones, where they just exaggerate, like, it's... Oh, oh sure, yeah, sure, 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 yeah. Oh, geez. Yeah, but with the 60s Batman one, it feels like everything's just on point. Pretty much everything's on point. The only thing that people miscommunicate about the Batman 60s show sometimes is they always go, it's very funny that he's so campy and joyous and he's a vigilante. And it's like, no, he's a deputized agent of the law. Yeah. And that's what makes it even more interesting because they work with him. They have the phone. He's like, he's just a fellow policeman, basically. But he's like a weird yeah. cartoon guy in a bat suit with, can, a little, with a young teenage boy. Yeah, it can simply be funny that he just calls someone and says, it's Batman. It's Batman. And everyone goes, Batman. <laughs> everyone knows. <laughs> One of my favorite cutaway gags was when, uh, when they wanted to find out who where this submarine came from, and Batman's like, "That's it, I gotta phone up and see who sold submarines." And they cut to this admiral character with his secretary. They're playing tiddlywinks, mm. <laughs> like just to show how cartoony this world is. Because that's the thing: people, you either have to accept or you cannot accept that the Adam West era Batman is a comedy. If you can't accept that you can see Batman being comedic, then there's nothing for you here. And you see that with a scene like this, in which 
you see a guy playing a, a, a superior, you know, like a, a high level ranking member of the of the yeah, navy would, yeah. playing a game of playing literally tiddlywinks, right? Even if you don't know what it is, it's a very childish looking game, it's, and it's very childish to see him do it. Yeah. And that tells you that this is on purpose, because I think one of the other miscommunications about the Adam West era Batman stuff is people think it's funny now sometimes because of look how goofy it is. And it's like... But, like they didn't know. But that's because it's dated, right? They always go, ha ha, it's the 60s. Look how campy it is. And it's like, yeah, but that was by design. Hmm. It's a comedy show. It's a comedy movie. It is literally supposed to be funny people sometimes will bring up the shark repellent scene and be like haha how stupid it's like no it's haha how funny because it's a fun it's literally supposed to be funny yeah. but sometimes people have their hate boners on so much at the idea that batman it can be taken in a non-serious direction and if it wasn't and people also don't like the fact that if it wasn't for adam west's batman a lot of the things that people love about Batman wouldn't exist. You wouldn't have the Riddler. Frank Gorshin's performance as the Riddler made that character come to life. He was a forgotten comic book character. He was in there, but he was forgotten. He was a minor character. He wasn't that popular. But Frank Gorshin brought this energy to it, and now we have the Riddler, and you can't imagine what the landscape of Batman would be without the Riddler, yeah, can you? he's part of the rogues gallery. He's one of the most famous villains in comic books. And now the new Batman movie with Robert Pattinson, he's the villain. Oh, okay. Um, played by Paul Dano. <laughs> weird, uh, interesting casting choice. But, and you wouldn't have Batman be as reinvigorated again because Batman, the comics were dying at that point. But then the series came along and gave juice. You wouldn't have all of these things like with the Penguin. Bur Burgess Meredith brings all of these things from the Penguin that you see that were from the comics, but he brings his own quirks into it that you see translated again and again after the fact. And same with Adam West and Burt, Woods and Burt Ward as well. But the movie is funny, and there's just so many... <laughs> There's just so many gags, so many ludicrous moments. One of my one of my favorite moments is when they're breaking down how all of the villains must be involved, and ba and Robin says, like, and Batman says, yes, and the boat was on the sea, and Robin's like, of course, sea, sea for cat, Catwoman, <laughs> and it's like the that, logic, that the, scene, the logic of it all. That entire four way conversation <laughs> is great, and pretty much all of the scenes in this film where they're breaking down, <laughs> which translates to finding out exactly what's going on just through their own. <laughs> superior death note wit alone <laughs> all of that just really tickled my funny bone yeah all, all the duo of riddles that they instantly solve yeah and probably my favorite part with the joker in the film is when he breaks out of his giggly persona to actually get pissed off at the riddler because he's basically <laughs> just telling batman and robin where to go next and what's great about that is you need that in this movie because that's what works so well about having, like I said before, you need the villains to have conflict within themselves because they're not always going to be up against Batman, right? Batman, and even if they are, the design of Adam West Batman and the design of Batman as a character is he's not always going to be, he's not a vocal player a lot. Like, he's not going to be going, uh, yes, I'm going to have a verbal con conflict with you and drama. He's going to come in there and be like, stop what you're doing, it's time to fight, right? So in this movie... You need the villains to have some kind of conflict other than just that. So what is it? Internal conflict with one another. And you have that moment where the Joker is like, stop doing that. You're ruining everything. And then the Riddler does the old, but that's what I do. This is my character trait. <laughs> and then the Joker's like, I don't appreciate that. It's stupid. Yeah, it's internal conflict, but it's also like, this is my character. So it's and, reinforcing. And then they do that with the Penguin earlier too, where it's like, Penguin, you and your stupid submarine and your stupid torpedoes, they never fucking work we're not gonna do that anymore and then the riddler does the genius plan of what happens if we just do all of our things all of them it still doesn't work because the age-old thing of nobody knows that bruce wayne is batman so they always want to kidnap bruce wayne and then they realize and then it doesn't work because bruce wayne is batman but they don't realize that part <laughs> and the funniest thing i mean it's not in this movie but it is in a way where it the funny one of the funniest jokes is how obvious Bruce Wayne and Batman being the same person is because Adam West has the most striking voice that you could ever choose. <laughs> it's his version of like the Clark Kent hair. Yeah, and 
you have the iconic scene, it's not in this movie, but the iconic scene where he has to be on the phone at the same time with Batman and Ad- uh, Bruce Wayne. And he's like, <laughs> he's not even trying to change his voice because they have the same voice. It always reminds me of uh, Phil Hartman, right? Phil Hartman was like the man of many voices. But then when they were doing The Simpsons and they did a table read and both Lionel Hutz and Troy McClure were in the same episode, he tried to change his voice up for one of them and they're like hey that doesn't sound right do it normal and then they realize it's because Troy McClure and Lionel Hutz have the exact <laughs> same voice because he only had one voice yeah. but you you always thought it was different for yeah, some reason it's a magic aura had, yeah he had a different character for both yeah he had a different character but they were the same voice same voice different character yeah <laughs> hello I'm Troy McClure and then hey it's me Lionel Hutz <laughs> like that's the difference it's like one's a bit more like yeah yeah and the other one's like yeah but w- who was your favourite villain Ah, uh, that's a tough one. Um, that's a really tough one. Don't piss. Don't don't pick the fishy finks. Okay, <laughs> he's he's goons. One. <laughs> that's the, the, the guinea pigs. The, the yeah, the <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, and they explode and die. <laughs> a Batman gives a solemn, very very solemn. They won't be back in this universe. <laughs> it's like. <laughs> Fuck you, they really killed those guys. <laughs> they turned to antimatter. Yeah, Batman gets very serious about like playing God with them. Like you saw in this very room what happened, and Bert Ward's like oh sorry, Robin's like, Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Bert Ward was like, Yeah, you're right. It's like no get in character. So Um Honestly, I think it might be between the Riddler and the Penguin. Well what about Penguin. Yeah, he has that he has uh, what what about the Riddler? worked for you in this in this movie i liked how (laughs) again i like how maniacal he was and i loved his whole gimmick of like i I need to send riddles and they're always (laughs) ridiculous riddles and they lead to you know some of my favorite gags which are the interpretation things um i I guess it's also a product of the writing but yeah he's just a very fun persona like even next to the joker he's probably the craziest one here He's insane, and he's more insane in the show. In this, he actually plays a straight man out of the group the most. Mm. There's many times where he's just like, can we stop being idiots and just focus on the plan? And then when he's allowed to take the spotlight, because the Penguin and and uh, Catwoman have the spotlight for a lot of the, the plan. Yeah, they're the most proactive ones that interact with Batman. But when he has... and Yeah, and they, yeah but when he has the spotlight... He, he he gets drunk on the power and his eyes just start bulging. And one of my favorite physical traits that Frank Gorshin did was when he gets really into it, he starts like rubbing the his neck with his hand. And it's just like, it's just like this impulsive thing where he's like, oh yes, I just can't. Like, and he just starts rubbing and it gets more, more vigorous and more weirdly yeah. sexual. And yeah, play poker with that guy. Yeah, yeah. And he's, he's just gestures and his eyes and the laugh. The he, I can't do it. He, he he can do it, and him and the Joker have perfect laughs. Like they're very different from one another, but they're very maniacal and insane. But I've always loved the Riddler. He's my favorite Batman villain. I loved Jim Carrey's version as a child, but I've always liked Frank Gorshin's the best. And I like Jim Carrey a lot, but I can't help but look at it and go, it, he's just doing Frank Gorshin, and Frank Gorshin's an impressionist by nature. That was what he did mostly. And I can't help but remember that Jim Carrey started out his career doing impressions as well. And I'm like, I get it. You got the new Frank Gorshin to play the Riddler, and I get it. But He's at the same doing time, an impression of the impressionist. <laughs> one of my things that one of my downsides of watching Batman Forever as I grow up is, as much as I love Jim Carrey's performance, it's still great. Him and Ed Begley Jr. in that one scene where he's like, "You're fired," and just lets him go. Um, I love it, but I I grow to love it less because I've seen Frank Gorshin's performance now. I've seen the show and I've seen the movie and I just know that Jim Carrey's just directly stealing and taking. It's taking, not embellishing on anything. It's not evolving. Yeah. And this, I look at it, even in this movie, which I don't think Frank Gorshin gets as much to do as he does in the show, obviously, but I can see why you would gravitate towards him because he just, he has a presence about him. The way he strides across, like, there's this one scene, he doesn't even have to say anything, where he takes off his jacket and you see, like, the back of his waistcoat matches Mm, the interior. And it's like, and the way he strides across and explains his plan, just physically he's, he's imposing and demanding and adds a real level of crazy and sinister insanity. And you can see how... His interpretation, just in this one movie, 
of playing the the typical Riddler who's like an insane genius who just can't help but do riddles, but also like a an actual psychopath, you can see how that performance has made the character go for decades on now because we've seen in the Arkham Knight games, in 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 in, in the comics and movies, Jim Carrey, we've seen so many different interpretations take those elements from this performance and just heighten them and change them up and evolve like the Arkham Knight Riddler he's very different and crazy and weird but you can see he's the, got a very big inferiority thing going but on but you can see the elements in Frank Gorshin's performance where that inspired down the road that interpretation isn't that interesting to think about mm. isn't it also interesting to think about that this is the first live action interpretation of the Joker and he's played by <laughs> a non-white actor who's also, like, 60 years old, and he's, like, six foot three. Yeah, I, I had that realisation last night as well. <laughs> and and also, you know, as big as the Joker is, he's kind of, like, the, I guess, smallest role of the villains in this film. Which is fun. I kind of like seeing the Joker play second fiddle to all the others and be, like, really buddy-buddy with the Penguin and be like, yo-ho! And just, like, he, having a fun time. He really time. likes having to, like, relay the, like, fire torpedo <laughs> thing. It's like, oh, can I say it now? And he likes flying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he likes flying. I love the image of him cackling on the broom. <laughs> it's so amazing. But, uh, yeah, I can see, I can see that. Uh, the Riddler is a fun time. This is not the TV show Catwoman. Um, Lee Merriweather is just for this movie. Yeah, the original one was like doing another film. Julie Newmar, yeah. yeah. And I've always liked Catwoman enough. Uh, I saw the Michelle Pfeiffer one, and we all know, I've said this before, but outside of Heather Gray, Michelle Pfeiffer is another actress that I find insanely attractive. Mm-hmm. And of course, I've I liked her interpretation. See, that's one where she, her interpretation is completely different from like the 60s show. Yet it still has elements, but... I, as an adult watching it now, I always said the Riddler was my favorite from from these from the sixties. Julie Newmar's Catwoman, as an adult, is my favorite villain in 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 the sixties show, and her not being in this movie is a is a bummer. But I think Lee Merriweather Lee Merriweather does a really good job. She does a really good job of flipping between the oh I'm a nice innocent girl to I'm a complete psychopathic yeah. criminal bitch. Yeah, when you were asking me uh, which was my favorite villain, it was mostly me thinking like, okay, well I think I put Joker at the bottom, but the other three all have like really good stuff going on. Yeah, and they give her a lot to do in the movie because she is the one who can actually change her appearance. They yeah, do the logic. Kind of they do the logic of what you said about Clark Kent with the glasses, where at the end they remove her little thing on her eyes and then it's like Kitka <laughs> yeah yeah I really enjoyed her because the the Catwomans that I've seen are like you know the Arkham games the animated series where she's kind of like an anti-hero kind of role like relationship yeah. with Bruce Wayne kind of thing so actually seeing full-on villain Catwoman was really interesting and like how she had these really strong cat mannerisms. Like, sometimes mm. she wouldn't get into a scuffle. She'd just, like, stay on the sidelines and, like, snarl and, like, raise yeah. her claws. And it was really fun. Yeah, and I like... <laughs> she had a little cat. Yeah, she had a little cat that could sniff out the weak spots of doors. <laughs> <Remember> <laughs> yes. That? I'm just, a sucker for cats, so that helped. Just a just a little tidbit about the 60s show again. With, with Julie it. Newmar, what I liked about hers, and this doesn't need to be in this, is her and Adam West have some of the most palpable on-screen sexual chemistry I've ever seen in a show. Wow. Julie Newmar's Catwoman is pure sex. Not just saying it because she's really sexy to look at, but that character just exudes sexuality. And that is what I think Catwoman has really just kind of devolved now into. When I play those Arkham games or when I even see Anne Hathaway's Catwoman... And it's like, okay, this is, oh, yeah, or, or yeah. Michelle Pfeiffer's even. It's like, okay, we get it. It's a fetishistic character at this point. But with Julie Newmar's and with Lee Merriweather's, there's this level of elegance to the character. Julie Newmar's one, I've always got the interpretation that she was another socialite like Bruce Wayne who's just decided to do this because fuck it. That's how she performs it. And Lee Merriweather does that a little too. And Lee Merriweather does a better job in my interpreter, in my, in my view, of. Catwoman in the show would do the disguises. She would pretend to be someone else, but she always had the crazy Catwoman eyebrows, no matter okay, what. Yeah. But in this, 
Lee Mayweather, I think, does a greater job at pretending to be the character that she's playing than than uh, Julie Newmar's. Julie Newmar's one was a little bit too crazy to keep up the facade, and then and eventually it, yeah, Batman uh, would be like, "It's you, Catwoman." Yeah, it sounds like you're saying that like the the indicator that it's Catwoman is always there, the, the eyebrows thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which I guess is like, good for a gag, but yeah. And it's also they're fucking awesome, <laughs> but. <laughs> Julie Newmar's one would fumble up the disguise far more quickly and far more like in character with what she's doing. Well, Lee Merriweather, Lee Merriweather's one is far more competent at that, and that makes her far more deadly in the group of silly criminals. Hence, her and the Penguins dynamic is really interesting because they're the only one they respect one another. In my opinion, they they rarely ever have a tiff with they one are, another she's kind of like your the, stupid submarine that's kind of it that she yeah, has it they, like, are, they are the mother and father of the criminal underworld <laughs> well, what was it called again um united you, uh the united underworld united underworld yeah. i love their design of the giant squid thing squeezing the planet earth <laughs> i want that on my wall that is the greatest thing ever made um so how was it seeing adam west actually be batman because Mimetic culture is what you've probably understood his interpretation of Batman more than actually seeing it yourself. Yeah, both people doing impressions of it and him parodying it. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, it was really good just seeing it for real again. again, Because, again, I barely remember watching the show and how he was there. I just kind of took it at face value that, like, oh, yeah, all these parodies are, like, doing what he did. And yeah. Yeah, he, he, he was doing the voice. He had a lot of, like... Uh, playing it straight kind of lines that yeah. are very funny because of the way he delivers it or the context. Like, again, all of the scenes where they're deducing things and he's just, like, explaining what he thinks. Um, yeah, it was it was just really good seeing it genuinely done. I, yeah, Adam West Batman and the 60s Batman in general, it rides this fine line of being 110% sincere and 110% snarky because from my understanding the people when they made batman the show none of them like batman like they all they didn't like batman they thought oh he's kind of silly mm. you know what would be fucking funny though if we took it seriously but like serious in terms of what happens if we just made the comics into a show and played it silly so it works on both levels for young children Adam West is this sincere, hope-filled, optimistic guy who calls people old chum. Yeah, man but, of the law. Man of the law. But when you see it as an adult, there is a level of snarkiness there. Uh, but he's still playing it sincerely. Hmm. So it's a fine balancing act from a comedic perspective of playing it for the kind of snarky, darkish humor that you can from even this campy element, but also playing it sincerely where... You can see why people loved this character sincerely. Children wanted to be Batman and loved Adam West as Batman and that he's this wholesome figure. But then you get a kick to the head when Batman would just suddenly turn around and give you existential dread, but he's doing every, it as Adam West. Every time he says, like, lawful alignment stuff, like, you know, not playing God, he's man of the law and stuff like that, it's all, if you listen to it, it's all, like, very genuine, real... <laughs> lawful alignment <laughs> stuff so but then the film and the show goes against it because it always shows you that the law and the things that he wants to uphold is fundamentally broken stupid or corrupt like the admiral playing tiddlywinks or or the or the chief and and the commissioner who can just not do their fucking jobs and they're terrible <laughs> at it and it's always adam west you know being like We've got to respect authority. And, you know, these criminals, we can always give them a second chance. It's like, there's always a level of comedy there because you know it's not it's not actually true. But Yeah, it's kind of like a lawful stupid kind of thing. But yeah, and it makes... <laughs> but that's what teams up well. There's a level of on-purpose futility and stupidity to Batman in this, but also he's such a perfect Mary Sue being <laughs> that it, it the clashing of the two is comedic gold because... <laughs> I love also there's this bit where the joke uh, where the penguin they know it's the penguin and they bring him to the bat cave and they spray him with the stuff and the penguin's like where's some water I could have and then, then Adam West as Batman says very sternly because he does not like interacting with these villains he says very sternly like 
it's over there. Like, and he says, like, it's clearly marked. And he says, like, the exact thing it's marked as. And you see the camera move over just slightly <laughs> in there. And he's fully labeled. And the penguin goes over there. And he fills up his water. And he's like, you're infringing on my rights. And all of this. And Batman just says lines like, huh, you dastardly criminal. <laughs> and he says all this stuff. Or the classic Batman. You went back in there to save those low-life drunks, and he's just like, "Well, Robin, they're people too." They're still human. Yeah. <laughs> and you can almost feel Adam West looking directly to the camera and saying to you, the audience, "That's right, they're people too." <laughs> I love, yeah, I love it whenever Robin, like, whenever Robin says something that like might slightly go into like free thought, like Batman is—is is this really right? And then Batman just like reinforces, like, "Yes, it is." And he's like, "You're right, Batman." <laughs> It's like, the answer's always, you're going to be right, Batman. There is an on-purpose level of condescension from his character, but it's so wholesome at the same time that you can't help but laugh. Like, we got to talk about the bomb scene, of course. The famous, sometimes you just can't get rid of a bomb, and how that scene keeps stacking on top of itself over and over again, to the point at which... I forgot, like, I remembered that there were the nuns and the baby and all that, but I forgot that they come back right at yeah, the end. Yeah, in, like, the, oh, same, in the same order. <laughs> because they go to the same point. And I laughed out loud and I said, oh, no, they're back, when I was watching it. Even though I've seen that scene a billion times, most of us have seen that whole sequence a gajillion times because it's really funny. But I just forgot how nuanced the physical comedy and the filmmaking was in terms of just racking up the t- the tension, dare I say, in this comedy and, set piece. And all the different examples of, like, wholesome things Batman can run into that he has to get away from because he's pe- carrying a bomb. And people's genuine fear reactions to seeing, like, this cartoon bomb as well. Like, it's such a cartoon <laughs> level bomb. I remember... I. Th- I think it might have been, like, a YouTube comment when I watched this scene for the first time forever ago. I was talking about how, like, there was that one point where Batman's gonna, like, go over the uh, the pier, and mm. a guy just pops up out of a boat, and, like, his instant reaction is like, oh, fuck, a bomb, so he just, like, ducks. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That was really funny. So, yeah, Adam West, physical comedy. Speaking too. of ducks, the ducks. <laughs> the wooden ducks that go quack. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good little punchline. Yeah, the ducks, and he's like, that's when he has the famous, some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. And then, of course, the capper to the scene is typical Adam West Batman humor of the cliffhanger of, oh no, Batman's dead. And then he just, like, he's right next to Robin. He's like, actually, I'm over here. And I was safely guarded by these iron rods here that I was hiding behind. And yeah, well, not, we can not even on. over him, but just like he's standing behind him. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, but from Robin's perspective, he was running straight towards, he would have seen Batman physically yeah. crouching there, but it, you have to do the cartoon logic yeah, of... You have to do the hugger fogger behind the grave. Yeah, you have to do the logic of, well, he didn't see him there because it's going to be a twist yeah. reveal. Now, that's... He, can't, he can't see him because the camera can't see I him. I wish Ryan Johnson directed this movie because this is all about subversions of expectations <laughs> the porpoise the rods oh the porpoise oh, yeah, we what didn't did, mention the porpoise yet. What, i mean I, I i said the line but what did you think of that because to me that's also one of the most famous scenes in the movie but it's probably not as mimetic but how did you feel when that happened because could you just set up what that 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 whole sequence is yep so uh when I mentioned earlier that there was a yacht that disappeared, they find out very soon after that there is a buoy or a buoy, whatever they call yeah, it, buoy, yeah. in in the sea that has a uh, a projector, a project, uh, projection machine in it, and they want to go there and look for fingerprints because maybe that'll lead them to who the villains are. Mm. So they go to it, and the villains activate a super magnet that is inside <laughs> it to trap them because they have their utility belt, which they can't take off, <laughs> which they can't take off, um, <laughs> and because now the heroes are trapped. They can send a trio of torpedoes at them. Yeah. Batman can take out the first two with a gadget that he has, but it runs out of batteries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Batteries. Um, and then the third one is shot. We don't see Batman. It explodes. The villains celebrate. And then it just cuts to Batman and Robin <laughs> in their bat <laughs> boat. It's going away, and Robin says something like, gee, that porpoise. It, that it, human-like porpoise. That human-like <laughs> porpoise got in the way. And then Batman has this very sincere thing like it sacrificed its life for us we must never forget it what like a noble that. creature yeah. and what i like about that is it's just where there's funny meta moments where you know they did not have the budget to explain how they got out of that so they just did the laziest option which in turn makes it the funniest option yeah because when we talked about troll 2 right you would have moments like that where that movies are cheap or like these good bad movies where it's like the budget constraints and so 
but they have lofty ideas, so they have to work around, and it's always funny. And this is an example of that happening, but it actually plays into the comedic beats of the movie, and it's probably one of the funniest exchanges in the whole fucking film. Deus Ex Machina is often a trope that is criticised because it's all about convenience, but this film... And I, I guess this whole series, of, if you're going to tell me that, mm. uses it for comedic purpose. Oh, yes. Yes. It's... Intentional comedic purpose. Porpoise. <sighs> you fucking asshole. I uh, also got to appreciate, it's always very funny to me. It's always very funny to me to think about a diehard Batman fan sitting there frowning <laughs> profusely when Batman is is going like... When he's come back as Bruce Wayne and he's like, oh, i got to go to the bat pole and whatever. And he goes bat- down the bat pole and he flicks a switch that says like instant bat- Batman costume <laughs> change or whatever, which I don't remember being in the series. So <laughs> there you go. And he flicks down to his uniform, his little outfit and they're all there. And Alfred comes down and he says this whole entire thing. And, and it's like, this is the point in the movie or the story where it's like, okay, the, the heroes are figuring out what's going to go on and they're going to stop and get the villains and they're going to go on their way. But, but, but then he goes, Hold on a moment, Alfred. Do you have your driver's license? Yeah. And Alfred stops the scene to go, Why, yes, I do, sir. It's in my pocket right here. Do you need to see it? And Batman's like, Oh, no, Alfred. I'll take your word for it. You're an honest citizen of the law. <laughs> and then he goes back up the pole to get out of his outfit to go be active with Bruce Wayne. It's like, Why did he get dressed in the first place? And it's like, Because he's Batman. He can't just... talk in that scene without being Batman. Because can... it's just a reflex. Like, Oh, I flicked it. Or whatever. And... I can imagine the, you know, Batman fan just sitting there frowning and what the fuck is this? And I'm like, it's funny. That's what it is. Do, it is uh, inherently funny, even more so now that Batman's got grimmer and grimmer and grimmer. And it's like fucking Ben Affleck grabbing a kitchen sink to hit fucking Superman over the head. And he's like, I'm going to fucking stab you with kryptonite to remember that all of that would not be here if it wasn't for this series and this mm. movie. And Adam West's performance within them, mm. and I just find that inherently funny. Now sitting there imagining a die a diehard Batman fan getting angry at Adam West Batman because if they're really a diehard Batman fan, they would be sitting there being appreciate you know appreciating it because if it wasn't for this and the popularity that this gained and the popularity of his performance as this character and the investment that he put into the character. Would we have what we have now? The things that yeah. people like? You no. Know, you know, um, you know the scene where Batman discovers that the Russian lady was Catwoman. He looks at the camera, and it's that really long shot of him staring. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They should have a version of that where he stares into the camera and says, "I did all this for you, future of Batman." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. They should have had that scene, but it's shot in like this terrible brown-looking color, <laughs> and then you hear her off camera say, "My mother. Her name is Martha." And he's like, "Martha." <laughs> Where do did you, she get that name? <laughs> do you know if the guy who recommended this film for us, David, likes the film? Or? I think he likes the film. Mm-hmm. We talked about it positively. Um, but again, people who like these, you know, the later generation of Batman, the new generation of Batman, or the games, all this, there was a reflex for a very long time of outright denying and hating this because it isn't their Batman, right? Mm-hmm. That change has changed slowly but surely as even the new Batman era stuff has a far more open embrace of its history. Uh, Mark Hamill's Joker outright has so much Cesar Romero shit in there. But like the Arkham games has lots of callbacks and hitherto moments of, you remember this and this and this. And well, I, even played, the, I played my second playthrough of Arkham Knight using the 60s Batman costume. And the Dark Knight, like... The Joker, the mask he wears at the beginning is a clown mask that the original that Cesar Romero wore in one of his first appearances. And oh, Troll 2. It's opening up more so. And obviously with the passing away of Adam West, that has opened up a great deal more as well because we lost, we lost him, you know? We, we lost Batman. For many people, this was Batman. Can we say that about Michael Keaton? Can we say that about Christian Bale and Val Kilman, George Clooney and Ben Affleck? They played Batman. They have too much else going on. outside of Kevin Conroy, who else is Batman? Adam West. He's Batman. Like, even for those diehard Batman fans who are going to get pissed off hearing this, a part of the legacy Batman has is, that's Adam West. He was Batman. Same with Kevin Conroy. Kevin Conroy, he's Batman. 
with the other ones, Michael Keaton, all these people are named. I love all of them. I think they're all great actors. I think they all offered something to the character. But they're not Batman. They never, they never became, like, they, 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 they did really good jobs, or they really interested, or they did the Bruce Wayne stuff good, or they did this good, whatever. But they, were, they aren't Batman. I want That's how I kind of look at it. I know it's very simple, but they're not Batman. I don't know if this question is too far out of left field, but can you make any sort of comparison between this Batman and Lego Batman from the movies? Like, is there a... Fuck, the Lego Batman movie is just this fucking movie, but it's in Lego, practically. Like, it is just as silly and over the top. But again, people take that because, well, that one is supposed to be funny. It's supposed to be taking a jab at the material and it's a cartoon. It's like, again, like I said before, some people don't, think hard enough to know we even acknowledge that it's the exact same principle with this they just look at it going oh it's a 60s silly 60s era thing they didn't understand batman or batman grew up and became something better you know it's that kind of logic yeah where oh well frank miller came along and made batman awesome you know it's that kind of logic where it's like there are a lot of people who probably worked on 60s batman that are older than the comic at the time yeah and so I think it's great that the 60s era Batman in this movie has gotten far more appreciation, far more love. The new one with Robert Pattinson that's coming out, all I'm seeing from it is just, wow, they're taken from the 60s one. Like, his cow looks very much like the Adam West cow in a lot of ways. He's riding just a muscle car, which is what Adam West one is. It's just a muscle car of that era with bat shit on it. It's not like bat Tim... Shit. You know, like, it's just bat-related crap. So I was thinking, like, literal bat shit. <laughs> Imagine. But, like, weird bat crap on it, right? While Tim Burton and fucking Christopher Nolan, they made their Batmobiles, and they're just, like, weird whatever fucking cars that are, like, designed for movies. Mm. While the 60s show and this new one, it's like, oh, it's just a muscle car with a bat logo on it. And I just like that, you know? And obviously yeah. Robert Pattinson's like a bizarre casting choice, as was Adam West. Adam West was a bizarre casting choice, even for back in the 60s, because he got cast because they really liked him in these funny little commercials in which he was doing a James Bond type parody or doing like <laughs> a that type parody. And they just liked his energy. And they brought him along because he could have just been played by, you know, your George Reeves type who did the old Superman where it's like, broad-shouldered and I'm a man from the... Six, you know, I'm actor man from 60s show. What's Instead, his name, George Reeves? Uh, George Reeve, the one before Christopher. Oh, they have the same last name. Yeah, well, one is Reeves and one is Reeve. Okay. But George was the one I mentioned in our Unbreakable episode. He was the Superman who encountered the situation in which a kid brought a gun to try and shoot him because he thought he... Oh, right, was yeah. really Superman. And then he defused the situation. That's where that story inspired. See, so older stuff, some people also just reject. The further back you go, the more likely people are to reject it sometimes. I don't stand by that philosophy, nor do you. But even our, our friend Sam Noonan, when we were talking about the 60s Batman, he's a guy I know that doesn't like to watch old movies because they're in black and white. Yet he studied film. You know, it's like, I don't agree with that. Some people just don't like that. So that's why I said at the beginning, if you don't like this Batman, it's not going to be for you. You know, you're either with it or you're not. And I kind of appreciate that element too of, we live in this age now where all these superhero movies, even if they're bland or boring or outright bad, there's this like big level of like, caveats you have to give it to it or people defending it or people being like well you don't understand Venom's actually a masterpiece yeah, because in, yeah. the, in issue 21999 <laughs> Eminem came in with it <laughs> <laughs> you know I mean? The big and, one I always hear is like, oh, but it's setting up a sequel. Oh, it's setting up... Oh, it's going to be better in retrospect. The Amazing Spider-Man movie is going to be better, Ryan, when the Sinister Six movie comes along and they explain who the guy in the fedora is. Yeah, as someone who's not into modern <laughs> superhero films, this film was right up my alley. And this is just... Here it is. It's the show on the big screen, mm-hmm. and the show is popular, and what do they do? They take all the characters that everyone liked from the show and put them in the movie. And they're all here together. And that in itself is the spectacle. That's enough. That's enough. Mm-hmm. Not, oh, oh, man. Could you imagine Zack Snyder's version of this? <laughs> the dehydrating machine and people would be, like, screaming while it happens. I was going to say, yeah, the the villains often uh, inhabit a very small room. So, like, they yeah. 
even though they move around a lot, it feels very cramped. Yeah, yeah. If we had it be incredibly cramped, grim, dark, and literally like a dark room, where you can barely a, see anything, you can barely see anything, it'll be very hard to tell what's going on. What the difference here too is, in comparison to the modern DC movies, the villains had a clear motivation that I could understand from beginning, middle, and end. They wanted money. It's always simple. I don't know best. what Lex Luthor's fucking motive was in Batman v Superman, and I'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> Something about angels and demons, whatever the fuck he was talking about. Angels come from that below. You know, you know, Batman's always talking about angels and demons. Uh, what else do you want to say about this movie? There's just a ton of stuff just in here. Yeah, do we have any criticisms of the film? Um, more Joker. More stuff for the Joker would have been nice. Mm. Uh... Uh, and more of it's always just I want more of the characters that I already like like the commissioner and the chief they're always fun like the best scenes are the four of them like you say breaking it down because you have two people who know exactly what's going on and two people who are so stupid that they didn't figure <laughs> it out there's some lines in the 60s show where they really where they really push the envelope with they are so aware of how incompetent that they, they are as characters that they just keep pushing it with the with Chief O'Hara at some point in the 60s show is just like, oh, well, I saw a riddle in the sky and I thought I could do my job and try and figure it out. But then I realized, ah, she's just phone Batman. <laughs> <laughs> like, they get to that kind of point. But I, I can't uh, think of any real negatives it just does what it wants and then it just ends <laughs> batman's like let's get out of here yeah this is our little tv show ending let's just leave <laughs> let's just leave <laughs> what about you this is your first time you're not that attached to this show like i am what about you i guess um in some ways yeah i do want a little bit more of some of the other characters that are underutilized since i'm not as familiar with them i'd like to see more of them yeah, art harriet didn't get any lines in the movie I don't even remember her. <laughs> um, but yeah, with the with the villains, sometimes I think maybe, you know, the, there are four villains. It's a lot to juggle and they all kind of have their own things going on. But mm. at times it feels like they're kind of ha having a tug of war with each other, with yeah. the attention and stuff. So maybe that gets a little bit you know, elongated at times. This film is like 15 minutes short of two hours. Yeah. Um, so at times I feel like the pacing's a bit slow, but usually mm. if Batman's in the scene, you know, I have no problems. What with about it. Bruce Wayne? Bruce Wayne? He was very charming. <laughs> <laughs> is it weird to see Adam West as a guy? Like without the cowl and without being a cartoon version of him. Is it weird to actually see just yeah, him? Yeah, not, not, be not being in costume, not being a cartoon and not being old. Yeah. Because I, I have seen him a little bit when he's older and like videos yeah. and stuff. But yeah, young him, he looks very tall, very handsome, very strong. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting seeing him play this like charming role. He was offered to play James Bond, you know. Well, he did those commercials as a parody. Yeah, right? but then he was like, an American shouldn't play it. Then they gave it to an Australian. <laughs> <laughs> they gave it to Jules Lazenby. So. Different colonized country. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I like... Yeah, I do like the sequence where he's with Catwoman and, like, Alfred and Robin are... I'll try to be modest, but Alfred doesn't want to be, <laughs> but he, he's like, okay, boy wonder, I'll try. Alfred wants to do the job, but then Robin, like, convinces him, like, no, okay, sure. And Robin, <laughs> like, it, it's hard to tell if he's... Uh, like, trying to be considerate or gentlemanly, or if he's, like, jealous. Yeah, yeah, because Bruce Ward's performance is just so specific <laughs> that you can get so much out of it as well. Like, I love Bruce Ward, Ward as as Robin, and I love the the fist in the other hand and just, like, wringing it out and being like, ooh! Yeah, he's so sincere. See, he inspired Cool Cat. <laughs> cool Cat has hey. a very, very Burt Ward energy where he's like, ooh! I love kids! <laughs> I also appreciate, I mean, a thing, another thing that I can see being a weakness of, of the movie too is, uh, you, 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 you can, like, the actual plot doesn't really happen for a very long time. Like, the actual villain's evil plan doesn't get revealed till really quite late in the game. And they have, like, the, the Commodore there, right? They, they've kidnapped him. And it's not like you ever got to really know that character. You know it was a little bit of a joke, right? Where he's like, I'm reading my Dickens, and he doesn't have any awareness of his surroundings. He's, he has no idea that he's been kidnapped. But you don't really get a full understanding of the stakes at the beginning. All you know is, oh, Batman's on the case. They've, they've kidnapped this guy who has some technology. 
and you don't find out for a little while and i feel like again that's a pacing thing where maybe a little bit earlier you could reveal because it takes them quite some time for him to grab out the dehydrator and then yeah. give it to the riddler yeah, or the joker sorry and then he does it and he's enjoying himself very much yeah it's like i said earlier the a lot of the plot involves them trying to lead Batman into traps and then Batman yeah. having to deal with that trap rather than continuing the story. Yeah, yeah. There was a nice little... I don't know if it was a callback, but there's a nice little reference to the 60s show, if I'm not mistaken, where... I can't remember if it's Katinka or Catwoman... Katinka? Katka. No. What was her name when she was Russian? It, yeah, I, so. I can't remember. I think it's but, more like Katinka. But, yeah. but... but Because that's the name of the Austin Powers... Um, Russian lady in the second one, isn't it? The one who's... No, that's Ivana Humpelot, sorry. Yeah. Um, she... Either her or Carol will make a reference to it. It's like, oh, down that hideous labyrinthian thing down there and in one of the 60s episodes catwoman's major weapon that trapped batman was she she had this labyrinth that she made and she's like hundreds of people have been lost in this labyrinth and you may find some bones while you're in there and you actually see like some bones and it's like oh geez but all it is in the 60s show is like some metal fencing like like a shitty <laughs> graded fence but it's always been one of, and she has like it's interior as well so you can't even and she has like a little cat flap on the roof that she leans down and just like makes fun at batman for being such an idiot at not figuring <laughs> out her labyrinth and if you touch it it's electrified so it zaps you and she's like ah you idiot and i just remember when she said that comment it made me think of that and i was like ah that was a great episode <laughs> so it has that little effect for fans too where it has those little tidbits of you have all the stuff. You have the you have the the phone. You have the the, the bat signal in the sky. You have the outfits. The, all, obviously, also a thing that we may take for granted now. Mm -hmm. But this also was a big thing. Of it had all the gadgets and all the, the it had the the, the bat copter and the, the 60s, bat boat yeah, and the and the car. And we take that a little bit for granted now. We just look at it and go, oh, they, they got a helicopter and stuck some wings on it. But at the time, that was like a big thing. And for the show's budget, it was a big thing. And they would use reuse footage of them using that for the show to be like, I oh, remember the bat car and the, I mean, the bat boat. And I love um, the penguin submarine with the little flaps. Love to make it so fucking good. Um, yeah, I can't think of much else to say. It's just a great show. It's a great show and a great movie, and the movie does a great job of translating the show, getting all the stuff from the show that works, and putting it up on the big screen, and giving you what you want, which is, I want to see all my favorite characters interacting, and it does that. Maybe some more time given to some other characters, but again... It still does it great. Joker still has great moments, like when he zaps them with his uh yeah yeah the, rings. the hand thing yeah and the and the penguin the buzzers. the buzzers and the penguin and the Riddler are so pissed off about it <laughs> and it's stuff like that and yeah they may focus more on like all oh, the penguin but at the same time it makes sense for those characters that this one's going to take this leadership position and this one's going to be the second. And it works in that regard. Like, I think maybe we take that look for granted now, knowing what the Joker's like. The idea of him being subservient to someone else is kind of absurd now, but... Yeah, instead the of, like, menacing leader guy. In the 60s show, it makes a little bit more sense for him to be that, although he's still fucking crazy. Hey, doesn't he have, like, have an episode where he surfs and there's another where he's like owning yeah. a bank? My, one of my favourites for the Joker is when he runs Gotham's National Bank and, and he doesn't do really any major crimes with it because he's just too obsessed to try to get Batman. And at the end, they're like, actually, you were like the best person they've had in charge of this bank the whole time. So, in fact, you've improved the bank. And he's like, damn you, Batman! <laughs> like, he's just so annoyed. It's like the salt in the wound. He's created too much order. Yeah, he's actually improved things. And he's like, damn it! And he's like, oh, what an idiot I am. And and he's far more of an egotist in, in the show. Like, he's far more, like, oh, yeah, loves I, himself. I imagine when he's the sole villain, he gets a bit more going on. Um, one of the things that is lacking in this is, uh, I mean, it's there. I mean, I always love the henchmen characters and they have the guinea pigs, right? But they don't really have much of a character. And then you have like the pirate ones mm. on the Yo -ho, sir. Oh, we've got to talk about every time Catwoman purrs, there's that one guy <laughs> who is very uncomfortable when she does I it. I mainly noticed it the one time, yeah. <laughs> It happens. The periscope. Oh, it happens when they're on the broomsticks as well. And she was like, when they got Bruce Wayne, and she's like purring, and he's like, mm, 
Mm, I do not <laughs> like this at all. And I appreciate that there's like one person there that's like, this is... The one who's always near Catwoman when she put us. This is a lot. I I also love the little, t- the little touch of, in the 60s show, the Joker, I mean, the Riddler has two outfits, which we see in this movie. He has his suit with the question marks and the tie and all that and the vest. And then he has like his leotard with the belt and he wears the little, um, what do you call that little thing you put over your eyes? Um, I don't know if they have a specific name. Oh, but, there, there is a name for but it. Either way. Domino mask? Domino mask. He has that. I like in this movie, all of them put those on when they're out doing crimes as if no one's going to know it's them. <laughs> like the penguin yeah, and his full <laughs> little penguin outfit. But in the show, I don't think they ever really did that as much with them as much. But the Joker and his full makeup and his green hair and his pink suit. And he has a little, his little thing on his eyes so they don't want to get caught. Well, that's usually a fictional convention, yeah, like a simple disguise works. I know, but it's just very funny from my perspective of in the 60s show, they set that up as the Riddler does that. Mm. And it's not even so much that he's hiding who he is, it's just a part of his outfit yeah. for that. But like the others don't have that for an outfit as much, but it was just kind of funny in this that they all had yeah, it. Like the... and it was actually a part of Catwoman's, mm. it actually worked for Catwoman. The, the trope is a natural evolution that led us to sorority boys, where it's clearly men as women. Yeah, yeah, and, and white chicks. Yeah. <laughs> It's clearly black men and white women. <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a fun time, um, a classic for for a reason. I think it's too unfairly judged by people who just think that Batman can only be one thing. Yeah, grimdark. And I would highly recommend that people check out the Adam West Batman series, but also the animated movies that they managed to do before he passed away. The Caped Crusader one is very good. In which, oh yeah, those are recent, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last one was the one the Two Face, because Two Face was never in the '60s show, and they got William Shatner to be the voice of Two Face, which you could imagine <laughs> he would have played it in the '60s show. Would have been amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I would recommend them because in the first one, which I think is just called the Cape Crusaders, Batman gets like a, he gets like dosed with something and he's like regressing through the different interpretations of the other Batman movies. <laughs> and he gets to the, like the Ben Affleck one where he's like punching people and you know, how does it has, oh, that's something that wasn't really in this movie. You didn't have the pow and the Kazan yeah, as it much on the while, screen. Like the climax. The climax. Basically. They waited, but Submarine. in that one, it has like concussion and internal bleeding and straight to ER and like hemorrhaging, <laughs> like all yeah, of that when he did it because he was not, doing yeah. the, he was doing the Ben Affleck broody, like, <laughs> and it's like, the idea that the 60s Batman could come back all these years later in an animated form and still give a deep commentary on the state of how Batman has just devolved into dark, broody guy who speaks like this. Yeah, yeah it's nice that because that, that whole, like, you know, word bubble things, or, or not bubbles, but those things, those yeah. have been parodied endlessly throughout yeah, pop yeah. culture since the 60s. So it's nice that it comes around back to an Adam West Batman thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad that... People grew to appreciate Adam West later in life. I'm glad he had a second, you know, wave of thing that he got to play himself a lot or got to make fun of the fact that he was Batman. And for a whole generation of people, they will just know him as Adam West, the man, the character, the he people know him as the character of himself more so than Batman. People of our gen of our age, people know him as Mayor Adam West more so than actually being Batman, which is interesting in itself because a part of that persona is the fact that he was Batman. <laughs> like, there's so many jokes in Family Guy, obviously, about him being Batman. And But I'm glad that he, he found a, a, a place later in life. And I'm also glad that he got to kind of see before he went, and same with Bird Ward, he's still around, but like they got to see that there was an, a, a, a newfound appreciation for the show and for their interpretations of these characters and of this mythos because obviously it cost them mainly Adam West their career in the long run it completely ruined Adam West's career to play Batman and there was a whole period of time where he was just fucking I don't want to fucking talk about but I mean as you would be but it's nice that he recovered from the typecasting right he recovered from it and made his own new typecasting which he was in charge of which is just the persona of myself (laughs) and it's great that that the actual guy got to see the the turnaround in a way because some you know, some of them don't get to see that. Some of it is like when we talk about these cult things or these popular things, it's like, well, after the person's dead, and it's like, oh man, what do you? Th- how do you think that they would feel about all this? And we actually got to hear what Adam West got to feel all about this, and actually got to see 
how happy it made him. So it's kind of nice. Yeah, um, he got to interact with people who loved that about him. Yeah. To end this, I'm going to tell you a very funny story about Adam West and Frank Gorshin. I better laugh. I think I've told you this, but it's uh, it's very funny. Mm-hmm. So Adam West and uh, uh, Frank Gorshin, the show is very popular, and they both got invited to a Hollywood party. Mm-hmm. And you know this story, I could tell. No, I just like the idea. They both went, you know, both respectable men, you know, happily married men. They went there, they went, this will be a fun time, we're popular now. Um, you know, Frank Gorshin was already pretty popular, he was an impressionist, and he was on the Johnny Carson show, all that. And they go to this party, and it's actually a Hollywood orgy party. It's a sex party. Right. And them being funny decided, well, I'm not into this. Wouldn't it be great if we were our characters (laughs) and I chased you around as the Riddler and you got to try and make people stop having orgy and interact with this and they got thrown out of the party (laughs) for being Batman and the Riddler. And could you imagine, I said this to my wife last night when watching the movie, when when the Riddler's doing his stuff, I'm like, could you imagine you're in an orgy and you're you're about to get your boner going and then he leans right into your face and does that laugh? (laughs) Instant boner. And And then you turn around and Adam West is standing there with his hands on his hips going... Riddler, stop interrupting that sex party. <laughs> and like, I love that story. Someone, if you want to hear more about it, there's an article about it in which Adam West talked about it being one of the funnest things about the show. Is just that <laughs> aftermath of it. And just, I think about that often. I just, I just, there you go. Again, both of them knew these are the characters. Let's do it to be dicks and be fun. And, and it's just wonderful. I'd love it if someone could be quoted from that being like, that made my lo- uh, that made my night, and I'd already ejaculated by that point. <laughs> I would love if Louis Thoreau was doing a documentary when that happened, <laughs> and then he captured that by by happenstance, and then he had a sit down interview with Adam West, but he was still playing Batman. That would be amazing. Oh man, what a what a what a legend! What a legendary series! What a legendary movie! And. It's great that you can get these now. Like the Blu-ray series, the Blu-rays and stuff available for the TV show. The movie's still a little bit difficult to find, but if you do your hunting, you can find it. I have it on Blu-ray, but for some reason, my multi-region Blu-ray player could not play the region that this Blu-ray was from, even though it's played Blu-rays from the same region before. So I lost out on listening to the Burt Ward Adam West commentary track for this, oh, which no. apparently is one of the greatest commentary tracks ever recorded. Apparently, it's right up there with um, Bruce Campbell's commentary track for the Evil Dead, where his commentary track for the Evil Dead won an award for how good it was. Yeah, and you can't listen to it anymore, right? Because uh, yeah, because they fucked around with the Evil Dead in yeah. editing. But if you can. Please listen to the Adam West Burt Ward commentary track because those guys were very self-aware about the legacy and about the show and about how goofy it was. And I would just love yeah, it sounds interesting. to hear them just joke about the shark repellent <laughs> and, and the shitty shark prop. <laughs> like, just how shitty. Like, I watch this on my big TV and it's really funny seeing the big, like... HD crisp image and it's like how shitty that shark looks. <laughs> See, the, co- the copy that I watched was rather blurry, so it looked fine. <laughs> it looked fine. So it, Emotionless, but fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Bartek, you're recommending the next episode, and it is a ho-ho Christmas time. Yes, triple ho, actually. If you're into that kind of thing, of course. Maybe Bartek will throw us a, a monkey wrench and give us eight crazy nights. Monkey bone. <laughs> oh, you know, I, we, I, <laughs> no one can handle monkey bone. <laughs> you know, I, uh, when I was thinking of films to do, I did actually go to Wikipedia and I looked up all of the categories for American Christmas films just to see, like, what is there? Yeah. And one of them was eight crazy nights. So I guess that is officially, according to Wikipedia, a Christmas movie. Uh, you know, it was really funny. I was listening to you going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and I thought you said Wikipedia, and I'm like, okay, this is a weird. <laughs> 
weird <laughs> Wikipedia. Okay, this is yeah. weird. The only entry hey, was Star Wars Holiday Special. Uh, was the holiday special in the Christmas list? Yes. It was? Even though it's but a... But it's not ho- a Christmas yeah, movie. It's a vague holiday special. No, 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 no. It's Life Day. Oh, that's right. Yes, Life Day. It's not just a vague holiday. It's it's for Life Day. Yeah. The time... We all sell it, which is very similar to Kwanzaa. Yes. But it's very much its own thing, Life Day. Yeah, the, the thing's called Holiday Special, but it's Life Day. So we're doing the Star Wars Holiday Special? <laughs> yes, we are not doing that. Um, way, way, way back early in the show, I think probably in our Meet Dave episode, I mentioned that I have a DVD copy of It's a Wonderful Life that I mm. still have not unwrapped. Oh, okay. I still have not unwrapped it, but I think in the coming week I finally have to because that is what we are doing next week. A classic. and uh, An absolute classic. That was a failure when it first came out. Mm. It only garnered its success because it was bought up by television. Mm. I and bought showed it on TV. Yeah, I bought it in the same store that I bought Story of Ricky. <laughs> Are you going to double feature those bad boys? <laughs> I, well, it has Oh, to... oh, you know, every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings, Ricky. Wah! And then Ricky like just rips the wings off of an angel and shoves it up its own ass in a yeah, meat grinder. Well, I, I also bought I spit on your grave from that store, so they... Wow, you really went for we like I can you know I like that And store. UHF all on the same day? Uh, not same day, but same store. No, no, I like the idea that you bought movie. those on the same day and the, the cashier was like, okay, what's well, a wonderful life? Yep. Oh, UHF? Yeah, I guess so. That's a bit on your grave. Story of Ricky. Like, and what, um, and then incriminating I said, evidence. <laughs> and then I said, you're selling me this. This is your store. Oh, I spit on your grave. <laughs> <laughs> I spit on your grave, Ricky. All right. Well, that's it, listening people. Uh, let us know your thoughts and all of that. Uh, we have our social medias, Facebook and Twitter. Spit and Polish Presents. You can email us at... Spitandpolished at gmail.com. Fairly easy. And give us a rating and review, old chum, on whatever podcast catcher allows it. So make sure in the interim to enjoy yourself and check out it's a wonderful life because that's what we'll be talking about next time uh bartek a pleasure as always helping you deflower yourself from a movie you haven't seen and next week i can't wait to help deflower you again Mm, from it's a wonderful life i have uh one question yes old chum did you like my singing at the beginning of the episode